All right, so hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our safety webinar covering the 10 most frequently asked questions about ASME safety standards. Presenting today is Tom Reardon, our technical instructor at Columbus McKinnon. Tom has been training with CM for 10 years. Prior to CM, he worked for 16 years in the crane industry and he's always also been with the US Marine Corps for 16 years of his life. So he's got uh, quite a bit of experience under his belt. My name is Gisela Clark. I'm the e-marketing specialist at Columbus McKinnon and will be your host for today's webinar. So just a few quick things, Tom, if you can advance. I just want to cover a few quick things before we begin. First off, the webinar is being recorded, as I mentioned, and you can look for an email tomorrow, probably tomorrow by the end of the day with a copy of the recording that you can look at and review and share. We're going to take five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. If we're really respectful of time, but our new rule now is as long as you have questions, we will stay on and answer them. So we make sure everybody gets everything addressed as they need it. Um, and the last thing I want to share is we take the best question asked during the blog post and we're going to, or sorry, during the safety webinar today, and we are going to feature it as a blog post in the coming week or two. So if your question is chosen, we're going to send you some cool CM promo item, a shirt, hat, work gloves, anything, uh, anything along those lines. So we encourage you to ask questions, okay? Well, we appreciate your attention. Everyone is in listen-only mode, so this is how we want to encourage you to ask questions, just as we did with the comments in the Q&A pane. So again, thank you for your attention, and now I'll turn the meeting over to Tom. So, oh, sorry, I've got a couple quick things to share. Go ahead. We're trying to change up the format a little bit. Tom, if you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So today's topics are the 10 most commonly asked questions about the safety standards and five are specifically focused on load testing today because of the great misinformation shared in our industry that Tom would really like to set straight. Okay, next. And finally, we just want to cover a quick disclaimer, which is basically that this training is attended for general information purposes. If you need some specific legal advice, we recommend that you contact a, a local professional. Okay, thank you. Now I'd like to go ahead and turn the meeting over to Tom so that we can begin. Tom? Okay, um, again, Gisela said uh, the top 10 questions we train across the country and I, we came up with the questions that are asked over and over and over and over again. And we tried to put them into this presentation. And the first question uh, that should come up on your screen, uh, which is very, very common, is what qualifications are required in order to inspect the crane? Questions such as, do I have to be certified? Uh, and that type of stuff. And the answer to that is not as clear as most people would like. Um, in fact, OSHA is nonspecific. If you go to 1910-179 standards, which are top-run overhead cranes, um, there is no mention in the 179 about uh, inspector qualifications. So we go to the B30.2, which is kind of the sister manual uh, to OSHA, and they state that a designated person will do the inspections of cranes, visual inspections, uh, conducted by a designated person. B3011, which is your underhung cranes, they use the term appointed person. And then you go to the B3016, which is packaged hoist, and they get back to designated. Well, you got to kind of look up the word designated, and both ASME standards and OSHA define designated as chosen by an employer as being qualified. So then we look up qualified and it comes back to competent. So it's really a circle there. CMAA in late 90s, 99, uh, 2000 time frame, CMAA came out with a publication. It was new then. It was a CMAA spec 78. And there may be other uh, documents out there that give guidelines for crane inspectors, but this is the one that's easiest to find. The industry is very familiar with CMAA. Crane Manufacturers Association of America. So they come out and they've published 2,000 field hours of experience. And that's that's fairly uh, tame, fairly modest, um, related to maintaining, servicing, and repairing uh, crane equipment. 
and the experience should provide a working knowledge of how to identify deficiencies, um, structural, mechanical, etc. Pass a written test. Now that is in the wording, and it actually follows what we have outlined in black right there. Uh, under no circumstances should an individual, uh, individual be allowed to perform inspections if they haven't had a prop, uh, appropriate training and cannot demonstrate a working knowledge of the codes, regulations, standards, etc. And the best way to assure that is with a written test. Um, that's pretty much where that comes in. It's, it's not so hard to achieve, but it's the only thing out there that I'm aware of uh, that defines the conditions uh, for a crane inspector. And then this next question is, is very common. There's a lot of myths out there in the industry about latches on hooks. Are they mandatory on crane and hoist hooks? And the answer is, I'm going to answer it with a yes. They are required. Uh, ASME B30.2 has a statement that says latch equipped hooks shall be used unless the use of a latch is impractical or unnecessary. This often gets construed, confused with um, inconvenient. Very different, uh, <laughs> very different meanings there. If it's impractical, um, then you can get by without a latch. If it's unnecessary, you can get by without a latch. B30.16, which uh, covers the, the packaged hoist items, is also a yes. Uh, and uh, the wording is a little bit better for those of us that need a little oomph behind our decisions to use a latch. They shall be utilized unless the latch presents a hazardous condition. Um, what would a hazardous condition be? Uh, maybe carrying loads over chemical tanks, dipping hot metal uh, type applications. That would certainly be a hazardous condition. But unless those conditions exist, hazardous or in the previous case with the B30.2 standards, unless it is impractical, unless it's truly unnecessary, then a latch has to be used. One of the big urban myths I hear often enough out there, people under the belief that if a latch did not, or excuse me, if a hook did not have a latch, then it does not require a latch. That is not so. Latches are easy enough um, to retrofit to a hook. There's many, many aftermarket uh, type latch kits that can be used. So really the default is latches are required. You have to have some overriding reason, uh, quite frankly, to go without a latch. Hey, Tom, a quick question on that. What would be an impractical or unnecessary reason for not using a latch? Because like you said, it would seem that why would anybody not want to use one? Can you just give me a quick example? Well, a big steel producer, um, they have machinery, they have a crane that, that does some production type work, but they also have machinery, big machinery, that needs adjustments very frequently and it's guarded with big cages. And those cages have to be lifted with a crane hook. Well, in order to use that with a latch on it, an individual would have to climb up the side of a 10 foot cage or guard, climb up on top of it engage the hook, then the guard would be moved, the adjustment would be made, the guard would go back, and that individual would have to climb up a ladder again, stand on top of a cage, and disengage the hook so that uh, okay. it could, that's, that's a hazardous or an impractical situation. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. No, thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We wouldn't want that. But and, and working around chemicals, okay. dip tanks, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Yes, ma'am. This is a big one. Also, uh, do I have to disassemble a hoist in order to perform a periodic inspection? Hey, hey Tom, really quick. Before we, before, yes. we, before I let you uh, go ahead and address that one, um, I'd like to go ahead and, and do a quick polling slide to see what people think about this. All right, so for those of you on iPads, you won't be able to vote, but for everyone else, um, do I have to disassemble a hoist in order to perform a periodic inspection? Just let me know if you think the answer is yes or no. We always like to get feedback from our audience. Uh, 
Excellent. So right now, Tom, it looks like 20% say yes, 80% say no. Go ahead and tell us. Uh, yeah, go ahead and tell us. What's the answer? Well, that's interesting. I would have thought it uh, would be a little heavier on the other end. Uh, the answer to the question is no. Uh, disassembly is not required. Uh, the ASME standards, they've They've changed the wording, but the meaning has pretty much stayed the same here in the last few years between the, the B3011 and the B3016. Um, but they state that the hoist may be inspected with the hoist in place. If you're looking at older versions, it specifically states uh, that the hoist does not have to be removed or disassembled. It does say the covers provided, such as the brake end cover, um, or any cover that's provided for inspection purposes, it has to be removed. But the caveat is uh, the third bullet point on this slide is if a qualified person, if something is found during the inspection, something that would make you suspicious, then a disassembly is required. And inspection could in, would include raising the hoist up, raising the hoist down, checking uh, the oil, uh, checking the condition of the brake. If you can lift and lower the hoist, there's no strange noises coming from it. Uh, you don't hear odd clicking, buzzing issues, things like that coming from the brake end of it. And everything seems to be in order, then disassembly is not required. But one of these inspections could very easily uh, turn into a full-blown disassembly. And that's decided by, you go back to that word, qualified. Qualified would uh, kind of means the same thing as a designated person. So unless something is found that is suspicious or poses questions, disassembly is not required. Anything out of the ordinary, anything that makes you suspicious, it is specifically stated in the standards that we have to disassemble it. Um, to what degree? Just whatever is necessary to pinpoint uh, the source of, of your concern or my concern. Okay. So it's it's no with the qualifier. Question four. This this not only gets uh, uh, brought up a lot in the classes, it, it also tends to uh, result in emotion uh, for people that don't like the, the rules the way they are. Are drop lugs or drop limiters or drop stops mandatory on un underhung carriers uh, for a monorail? Uh, hoist type system or the uh, underhung carrier even for an underhung crane and the answer is uh, specifically uh, not and first of all if you read the standards dealing with it would, that would be the B30.11 which would cover this the fact that it's not mentioned is proof in itself that it's not required if the standards do not state that you must do something or shall do something. There's no shall in there. There's no should in there about having drop stops. Um, then it's not a requirement. One of the memory crutches I give to the class is, is omission is permission. If it's not in the standards as mandatory for doing it or not doing it, if it's not addressed, then there's no guidelines. It doesn't have to be done. So and omission is This was just a little quote taken out. Omission is permission. That's, it sounds goofy, but it works for me. Um, it's a good memory crutch for me. Uh -huh. Okay. If it doesn't say you, if it doesn't say you have to, you don't. If it doesn't say not to do it, you can. Uh, essentially, literally, that is what it means. Um, I won't get into the, the moral aspects or the second guessing of it. But they specifically are not uh, required. The majority of them I see out there are. Uh, but this is just a snippet from an ANSI uh, interpretation, which uh, most of you are probably familiar with that. Interpretations are just co uh, responses, answers to questions uh, that people in the industry ask. And uh, no, they are not required. And then this question right here, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I am not a lawyer. Uh, I will give you my understanding of 26 years in the industry and being involved in, in issues, um, legal 
legal issues in that period of time. So the short answer to, to this question, are they enforceable by OSHA, is an absolute yes, they are. Um, this is a snippet that comes out of the multiple interpretations issued by OSHA uh, dealing with underhung cranes and whatnot. But essentially what is being said here is that if OSHA comes into a facility and they're doing a compliance inspection and they take issue or find issues that compromise safety, dealing with underhung cranes, monorails, hoists, that type of issue, OSHA 1910-179 does not apply to these types of cranes. So they cannot be written up as a violation of 1910-179 because it doesn't apply. However, if it presents a substantial hazard, an increase in the risk that someone will be hurt or injured, then OSHA can write a citation. It is a violation of the general duty clause, which is 5A1. And they can use the ASME standards, or ANSI, uh, pretty much the same thing. They can use these as a reference to support uh, the general duty citation. And just kind of in a nutshell, uh, the ticket, for lack of another word, or the citation would be a violation of 5A1 in that I was not following industry recognized uh, standards such as ASMI. They also go on, and they, all of these are available at OSHA.gov. Um, they go on to say, whereas they will use these to establish uh, that a safety issue or concern is already known within the industries, they specifically say this does not give ASME standards the power of law. Um, OSHA re retains that for themselves. So if they needed to establish the fact that it's an industry recognized hazard, yes, they will use uh, the ASME standards in their citations. This is com complex then, stuff. Hey, yeah. and really quick, Tom, go ahead and explain to them, uh, you mentioned early on, but the load testing, why the five last questions are focused on this topic? <laughs> uh, it is, without a doubt, bar none, miles and miles ahead of any other question that's asked on an ongoing basis. Um, how do I do them? When do I do them? This and that. It, 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 it outweighs every other question. In 26 years, <laughs> if I've had if I've had a thousand various topic subject questions, I've had two thousand load test questions. Interesting. It's, well, let's uh, let's uh, let's start with number six then. So, how often are load tests required on hoisting equipment and bridge cranes? Are you polling or you want me to No, nope, I'm going to poll on the seventh question. You go ahead and run with this one, Tom. Okay, with the exception of uh, one state for sure, California, load testing is not required, not by any published industry standard. Employers, different industries, that's not what I'm discussing here. According to any published standards, load tests are not required based on what time of year it is. Um, in other words, uh, quarterly load tests, semi-annual or annual load testing, it is not required. It is You will find it in none of the industry published standards. Uh, again, um, don't misunderstand this. There are industries uh, that have their, their guidelines. If you deal with the United States Navy, the NAVFAC 309, 307 uh, has mandates for it. California has certain intervals. But for those of us in general industry, it is not based on the passage of time at all. It is based on events or things that take place. Um, so it's, it's pretty cut and dried in terms of time. Excellent. Okay, so question seven. Under what circumstances is low testing mandatory? And I'm gonna do another polling question here. So what do you all think? Is it new installation? Replacing wire rope, when replacing the hook, when replacing the hoist brake, or none of the above? Kind of a trick question. I used to hate these on test, Tom. 
Okay, again, uh, under what circumstances is load testing mandatory? New installation, replacing wire rope, replacing the hook, replacing the hoist brake, or none of the above? And it looks like right now, give another, another second here. All right, it looks like 60% think new installation. 5% think replacing wire rope. 5% think replacing the hook. About 13% think replacing the hoist brake. And now we're up to about 20 that think none of the above. So go ahead, Tom. Tell us the answer. I bet we could have got more <laughs> diversity if we'd have put those answers in a different position. Um, oh, okay. The answer is the answer is new installations. New install, okay. In in talking about load testing, we've got to take into consideration that uh, you have OSHA, which is out there and deals with top run overhead cranes. OSHA gets brought up a lot in the underhung arena. Uh, when we're talking about underhung cranes, monorails, um, anything with an underhung component to it, then we're dealing with the ASME standards. So load testing, if we're dealing with OSHA, which is top running cranes, new installations, modifications, and re-ratings. That is it. That is the only time that load testing is mandatory. It is addressed with the word shall. Uh, we can pull this right out of B30.2 um, where it says cranes may be modified or re-rated. This is a quote right out of there. Um, modified or re-rated uh, provided they're checked thoroughly for the new rated load. And that refers you to paragraph K or section K. And the second bullet point on this slide, that uh, bullet point refers to a newly installed crane. Uh, we did not put that, or I did not put that on the slide, but this is the word the is prefaced by newly installed cranes. The cranes shall be tested in accordance with uh, OSHA 1910-179. Now, when we get to the underhung cranes, anything with an underhung component to it, so we'll talk about either the B3011, uh, B3016, which is the hoist, this comes to a shock, uh, as a shock to many, many people. But in the ASME standards, there is no occasion, nowhere is it printed that a load test shall be performed. The word that is used is should. New installations should be tested. Um, altering a crane, um, extensive. What most people get hung up on is uh, anytime you work on any load suspension parts, well, the wording is that anytime you do any work on load suspension parts, the hoist or the crane should be load tested. Should is voluntary, it's a recommendation, it is not mandatory. Some of you out there may be squirming in your seats because there is a paragraph that follows it that states, if a qualified person has determined that a load test is required, then it shall be done. But right out of the gate, um, underhung devices, there's, there's no publications out there that mandate load tests. Um, I jumped ahead. I thought I might have another slide there. We're going to go into some, some interpretations. OSHA has um, an opinion on this. Um, how powerful that opinion is in terms of affecting the industry uh, is another story. But top running overhead cranes, top run bridge with a top run trolley, absolutely. Hey. Installations, modifications, re -rated. I'm sorry, Tom, I've got a quick question that came in, and I'm going to ask it now uh, just because we're on this slide. But uh, the question is isn't changing a hoist brake not a modification? I mean, isn't it a modification? No. If I take an XYZ hoist brake, XYZ model 4, hoist brake yeah. and change it with an XYZ Model 4 hoist brake, that is not a modification. It's just a replacement of it something is. that's existing. So it's not modifying the equipment in any way possible. Okay. Correct. Now, All right. Perfect. Just wanted to get I don't, want, I don't want the folks that are listening here thinking that I, I'm not a, uh, a load test type person, that I'm against load tests. I'm just giving you the information. If you can load test it, do it. That would be my advice. Okay. Perfect. All right, we got a lot of questions coming in, so I've, I've been kind of tracking them down and telling everybody what number they are in the queue. So keep them coming. We're going to have a lot of time to answer them. But okay, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Thanks. All right, 
Um, what is a weight requirement when performing a load test? Um, this is uh, this is debated on both sides. Um, what is a weight requirement for performing a load test? If a load test is required, if it's mandatory, then it has to be 100%. The rated load of the crane or the hoist that's being tested, not to exceed 125%. Okay. Um, now. <clears throat> Many, 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 many people in the industry will, they're adamant that a load test has to be 125%. And some people will refer back to OSHA letters. Every letter that OSHA has issued that says 125%, the requirement for 125% is always associated, either in the same sentence, certainly in the same paragraph, 125% is always associated with a term or the terminology when rating the crane. How many of us, when we're performing a load test, are rating a crane? Uh, and I think that this came from the performance standards and in some of the ASME standards, especially for the packaged hoist, where it states that a manufacturer cannot rate a hoist at more than 80% of the load sustained during the test. I don't want to get into a math uh, class here, but 100% is a legal load test unless you are the entity that is assigning or rating uh, the capacity of that crane. 120, there's nothing wrong with 125, uh, but sometimes the logistics posed by a 125% load test are pretty uh, pretty huge. Um, going 125 percent on a one or two ton crane or hoist wouldn't be a, a, an issue, um, but going 125 percent on a 400 ton capacity hot metal ladle crane, um, that additional 100 tons could be uh, a huge issue. And uh, I'm not saying we don't do 125 because it's not convenient. Um, just giving you the facts. 100 percent is adequate in most cases. 125 is good. Uh, but it's not mandatory unless you are the person, I am, or someone is the entity of rating that crane. And then we have nine. Uh, I can share with you some really goofy stories that come out there about load testing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is a load test is quite simple. Uh, you take a rated load, it's either 100% or 125%, somewhere in between, no less than 100, no more than 125 lift the load, and all you have to do is lift it high enough to determine if the hoist will raise the load. So raise the load, lower the load. You just determine that the hoist will lift and lower the load. Move the trolley to its extremes, uh, left and right, and then move the bridge to the extremes. The end of the bridge runway in one direction, the end of the bridge runway in the other direction, and that is a load test. Uh, nothing more to it. You don't. There's no truth to this. Raise it six inches. Let it sit for five minutes. Measure it. Measure it before. Measure it after. Um, none of that is anywhere in the standards. If uh, fact of the matter is, if your holding brake will hold uh, hold the load for one minute, it'll hold it for five minutes. So up and down on the hoist, east and west on the trolley, north and south on the bridge. Uh, documentation. Documentation is very important. The reason for the load test and the results. And that brings us to, um, well, it's spelled out on the slide, brings us to uh, question 10. Please clarify load testing 1910, uh, K2 versus um, ASME. It's a should. Kind of talked about load testing. You have a top running overhead crane, top running bridge, top running trolley. New installations, modifications, re-rating. If you took that XYZ uh, part number four break and replaced it with an XYZ part number six break, then it may be a modification and load testing would be required. Um, again, back to the ASME standards, all their load testing requirements in the language are advisory in nature. Yes, there's a follow-up paragraph that if a qualified person says uh, or determines it needs to be done, then it does, but it's advisory. 
And again, OSHA can and does um, use ASME standards to support general duty clauses. There is, in fact, I think Gisela has a handout available on here. I There's do. a letter. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, Gisela? No, I was going to say, um, so go ahead and share it. But you can find it under the little handout tab on the right. If you click on it, um, you can actually drag and drop a file to or download your file to the desktop. This is the one he's going to be sharing in a minute, just as a reference. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Um, doo -doo -doo. Three, two, don't worry about it. You can just, uh, you don't have to open it, Tom. We have your piece cut and pasted. So. Okay. Um, but essentially, what if this is this is cut out of it. Uh, there's there's more to this letter above it, and it's an explanation of how OSHA does not have um, doesn't really have uh, authority over, or better word it would be underhung monorails, uh, underhung cranes, and things like that do not fall under the purview of 1910-179. However, this is an opinion on their part. And essentially, they're saying this deals, um, full disclosure, this deals specifically with B-3017, which is a top-running bridge with an underhung hoist. But the, the, the spirit is there, and it's addressed in other letters that address monorails and so forth. It is their opinion on an underhung device that a load test is necessary. They acknowledge here that the ASME wording is advisory in nature. And so they come in and they say that rate of load testing is a way in which we can establish that the structure of the building will support the crane or hoist. Uh, many of us fall back on, well, the manufacturer's load tested and ensured this. And OSHA comes back to, uh, we're going to conduct, a, or we want to, we're going to require you to conduct a load test because of assurances that the building the supporting structure will support the load. So, and this is, again, this deals uh, specifically with B-3017 cranes, but they have a similar, uh, very similar opinion, a very similar letter that was out on, on underhung cranes, B-3011 uh, type cranes. So, uh, it would be a general duty clause citation. Um, and I'm not sure how they would handle that if you'd have to talk with a lawyer, but OSHA feels that underhung uh, equipment needs to be load tested just as they're just as their feelings are just as strong about that as they are for top running cranes. However, uh, like I said, anything with an underhung component does not come on under the purview of OSA 1910 Okay, we've and, got a ton of questions, so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, I mean, we have, looks like we have about uh, 10 more minutes to go. So uh, if any of you have more, just please keep typing them in. The first one is, what is the progress of the B30.11 and B30.17 specification merger? There's a lot of duplication. Yes. Um, what, what can I say? I'm not on the board. I know that it is being done. Um, anything I... Any information I gave would be a guess, but I would hope uh, that it can be incorporated and out there in the next couple of years. Okay. But it is, uh, to that individual's credit, it is about 90% duplication. Okay. All right. Is annual inspection a periodic inspection? Yes. Um, people, people will refer to them as either one. A periodic inspection is an inspection... Uh, that occurs 30 days to one year. In a 30 day to one year period of time, it is a uh, it's a very thorough inspection. When so the true name for it is a periodic inspection. Those who provide service work um, and those that that get involved with it, they often use the term annual inspection. Uh, they are, quite frankly, the same thing. Most people we're usually talking about the same thing, but it's a very detailed nuts and bolts and, and everything inspection of the crane. So, okay. yes. And we, I think we have some articles on our blog, which I'll send everybody a link to when I send a link to the webinar um, so that you can look and read up more on this type of stuff because this is another question we get quite a bit. So, okay, thank you for that. Uh, question three, can you really tell from the outside whether or not something inside of the housing is truly safe 
and I know I get this question a lot because we, uh, you know, I manage our blog and the comments that come in. Um, I work in the entertainment industry, and I'd rather know that my hoists are 100% safe, hanging and holding a load above my guests and performance acts. And okay, so we have a question followed by a statement. I I agree with that individual. The 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 warm fuzzy feeling you get from taking them apart. Um, I I believe that if I can run a hoist, I have no problem with the ASME standards the way they are. Um, if I can run a hoist up and down and if it has a motorized trolley and a bridge and move it left and right and listen to it and watch it, uh, if I had any suspicions at all, I'd put a little bit of a load on it, I would lift it, I would lower it, I would see how it traversed. And if I saw no indications, anything, and I'm a conservative, suspicious kind of guy, um, if I saw nothing that piqued my uh, suspicion, I don't believe it's necessary to take it apart. The answer to the question, uh, anything could be inside. There could be something that didn't show its head, uh, didn't rear its head at that particular time, and yes, it could slip by. But the odds are uh, vastly against that, quite frankly. Um, but I so guess it, it kind of probably defaults to the person's comfort. So if they, you know, it, in his situation, he's talking about hanging hoists above people and performance acts, and he feels more comfortable mm -hmm. doing the testing, then he should. And his, and oh, I, I agree. Though. Yeah, so it kind of is it's in their discretion, but you're just speaking from from what the standards say and personal experience, or just industry, okay. Well, first of all, um, the way hoists are used in the entertainment industry where they're upside down, yes. oh, should the uh, ASME B30.16 doesn't apply. If you use that hoist upside down, it's right in section zero um, in the scope. ASME doesn't it apply. changes everything. Okay, so got it. So in his case, it's a different scenario altogether. Yeah, the entertainment industry is, is meticulous and you know, kudos to them. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. So that already, uh, that's a different situation. All right. Well, thank you for your question, Matthew. Um, next from Roger, is there a standard that requires a gearbox be inspected on a periodic basis, such as every five years? No, um, there is not, it would not be practical. Um, the short answer is absolutely no. I think that's more of a marketing thing. Okay. All right, um, and the next question is, what about chain hoist? I believe he's referring to the same inspection. Um, I, I'm not really sure, though. Um, uh, shoot, I should have asked it earlier. Anyway, well, we'll come back to that one. Okay, OSHA, as well as other sources, state that bumpers and stops shall be so mounted that there's no direct shear on bolts. Does the CM product line adhere to the specification? I can't answer that. I'm not familiar with our entire line. Okay. You know, Richard, I will I will reach out to our product managers and I'll have them uh, send you a response, okay? Um, Emmanuel Hoist, anytime a hook is changed, new load chain, new brakes on a manual hoist should be load tested. Um, yeah, this is the opinion of one of our attendees. I know the load testing is a is a really yeah, it's a it's a tough question. Like I said, we've written several blog articles on this too because um, because of how you know the different viewpoints on this. So can I can I jump point, in there? Please. When you get into the B thirty point twenty one, which deals with manually operated lever hoists, uh, depending on the lifting medium, that is the only ASME uh, B thirty standard which which we're talking about kind of sort of here. There are mandatory, the use of the word shall, occasions for load tests in the B30.21. It is the only one. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, next, does the load test include or exclude the lift equipment, hoist, trolley, slings, weight cradle, etc., hanging from the I-beam? I'm not sure I understand it, but a load test is... 100% of what the crane or hoist is rated, at least no less than 100% um, of what the crane is rated to lift. So that does not take into account 
the weight of the crane. We're talking live load, what would hang from the hook. That is what is considered 100% of what hangs from the hook. The load test is live load, live load being what would be put on the crane to be lifted or moved. Okay. Okay. If you're installing a crane or hoist, should it be load tested at 125% for the rating, or is it okay between 100 to 125%? If it has not been tested by the manufacturer elsewhere, um, if the installer is if I am the installer and I have to assign a capacity to that crane, if I want to rate that crane at 100 tons, I am going to have to test it at 125 tons. All right. What if there are obstacles that limit some travel of all direction? Um, I think when you were that's talking... Good. That's good. That is a good question. Uh, he's talking about the load test and moving the trolley and the bridge yes. to its extremes. Yes. I, if I'm not mistaken, there's specific wording in the standards um, that give us some kind of leeway in there to where we don't have to rearrange the entire building uh, to conduct a load test. Okay. Meaning we wouldn't have to move machinery and things like that. Okay. All right. So what are examples of modifications to load-bearing components if brakes aren't included? Um, I thought it was a modification or change. So replacing a component with the same component would be a change. Do you never have to load test if you're replacing a component with the same component? Uh, if we are referring to, do we never have to load test according to ASME standards? If the answer is correct, we do not. It is suggested language. Now, I believe that replacing most items on a package hoist unit probably are very deserving of a load test. Mm -hmm. So anything I'm, I'm saying here about the shoulds and the shalls, it's not my opinion. It's it's just the news. It's what's printed in the standards. I think uh, anytime load testing is, is possible, I think it should be done. Okay. Okay, excellent. So uh, I don't think I asked this one yet. Manual hoist. Does a hoist have to be tested prior to use? Or does a new hoist have to be, does a new hoist, okay, sorry, does a new hoist have to be tested prior to use? I'm assuming that they're asking about uh, load tested. Yes. If, if it was not load tested by the manufacturer, yes. That is very seldom the case, though. Um, most manufacturers do load test their hoists. However, uh, speaking specifically of us at Columbus McKinnon, if we send hoists out, less chain, uh, meaning without chain, uh, then there's a good chance that it was not load tested. And as far as I know, there's a notice that goes with it and states the responsibility of the receiver or whoever's going to own the hoist uh, to perform a load test. Okay. All right. Uh, um, the drop stop question on point four, uh, the question was asked about chain hoist. I believe. Um, oh gosh, can you pull that up? The fourth question about drop stops. All right, uh, lugs or drop stops mandatory on underhung trolley. Are they also mandatory on a chain hoist? The hoist has not. Okay, um, B thirty eleven. The the hoist itself has absolute zero to do with this subject matter. It is all, it, this comes right out of the B3011. The B3011 covers the trolley or carrier. The, the hoist is a B3016. There is, there is no, a chain hoist does not require um, a drop limiting device on the carrier or trolley. Neither do would a wire rope uh, hoist. But the, the, there are two different beasts. The, what kind of hoist has zero um, zero to do with the, the trolley or the carrier? Okay. 
Uh, really quick, just so you know, we are at the end, and we know that everybody, we promised you from 11 to 11.45, so if you have to jump off, please don't worry, you can go ahead. Um, but we are staying on as long as you want to answer questions, so um, just hang with us, and we'll just keep answering them until you guys have asked everything you want, okay? So if you are leaving, thank you for joining us. You will be getting a link to the recording, and if you want to stay, we will continue to address questions. Okay, so a comment. It's probably worth noting that no matter what any OSHA or ASME spec says, if something happens and OSHA believes something could have been done to better protect the employee, they will cite. I mean, it's it, it's a difficult situation. Is that a question or, is that yeah, a, question or a statement? It's more a, it's more a statement. So, yeah, so it, I mean, everybody has to prepare themselves in their given situations and leak, seek counsel if they need it, um, advice in these situations, because these standards are very complex, without a doubt, and everybody has to make sure they're looking out for the safety of their employees at the end of the day. So, did you have another comment to say? I mean, we have we have several more questions, so I think we need to. No, I. No. Okay. No. All right. Does a new hoist need to be tested? Oh, we talked about this. Okay. The new hoist needing to be tested prior to use, um, you've already addressed that. He said, I'm the appointed person in a paper mill with approximately 400 manual hoists. And uh, and you had just commented earlier, Tom, that um, I guess if the manufacturer should typically state that it has been tested, correct? There, it, should come, it should come with a load test certificate with it. If, okay. Um, there's a distributor between the manufacturer and the ultimate yeah. end user that may have that information. Yes, okay, perfect. So that way he will know that it already has been uh, tested by the manufacturer. Okay, manufacturer's inspection recommendations, are they law? Manufacturer's inspection recommendations. That's a good question. In the eyes of OSHA, the manufacturer pretty much trumps everybody else. Okay. Uh, if the OSHA goes with the most protective uh, guidelines out there, and oftentimes manufacturers' recommendations are the most protective, and OSHA definitely puts a lot of weight on manufacturers' suggestions and recommendations. Yes, I was going to say we have written a few blog articles about that as well. That at the end of the day, it's always best to look at the the manufacturers' the manual to see what their inspection recommendations are. Isn't that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. A few more. Are safety latches required on sling hooks? No. If they came with them, yes. If they if they did not come with them, no. Okay. All right. Next. Um, how long do you have to keep records? The court. The only publication out there is the CMA specification seventy eight, and it stipulates that you keep inspection records for three years. Three years. Okay. That's it's the only thing published that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, John has a question uh, about there's so much confusion, so many regulatory members in this arena. Why not one agency with rules written to the letter of the law, sort of to speak? I guess it's, it's oh, go ahead, Tom, you can address that. No, I don't have an answer. My answer would be cynical. Well, the thing of it is, yeah, there are many. John, you bring up a good point. There are a lot of regulatory bodies, and um, you know some of them are addressed on different things. And it's a very good question you bring up. It would make certainly make things, it would make things yeah. easier if it could be, but it is what it is. So we we can't change it right now. Monorail yeah. monorail cranes should should have been travel switch. Oh wait a minute, monorail cranes should have been travel switch or end stopped enough. Uh, I don't know, monorail cranes. I think the question is, if you have a travel limiting switch, yes, or end. Um, do they need end stops? Okay. Um, yes, correct. I, I would guess it's somewhere along those lines. If okay. if it's not possible because of the switching uh, and other provisions that are provided, if it's not possible that that monorail could run off the track, then uh, stops are not required. Okay. Good. Thank you for that. Do electric chain hoists have to comply with B3016 standards or are CE standards acceptable? I'm not sure what CE is. That's the European the Canadian? standard. No, that's the European standard. Okay. You have ASME hoist or ANSI hoist, and there is also a European standard. European standards don't necessarily uh, go in line. In fact, they don't in, some, in several areas. 
it's not an apples to apples comparison. Yeah. So if the question is, do they have to comply with European standards? The answer is no. Doesn't it really depend on where the product is being used? That no doubt is an issue. Um, for, for example, let me just give a scenario. Let's just say that we're a customer has an application in Europe and wants to buy an American product. So if they're using it in Europe, wouldn't it need to meet the, uh, the European standards where it's going to be headed and used? I I would think that would be the case. That there's sometimes you have things that are built to FEM standards that are, and I'm care. I, I want to be really careful about using this word, but they may have provisions that are considered nicer than ASME hoist, yeah. and then vice versa. You can have ASME hoist built to an ASME standard with a little nicer provision than CE. Yeah. But uh, yeah. as far as where they're used, I'm guessing there would be some territorial jurisdiction there. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think you just have to know. Okay. Uh, okay, there's just a comment here. Um, OSHA 1910.6 incorporated by reference list numerous ASME ANSI standards that have the same force and effects as other standards. It's just a comment uh, from James. Okay. Uh, sling hook latches. If it has a hole for a latch, one must be used, correct? If it was a sling that had a latch, yes. Okay. Correct. Okay, perfect. All right, and then one final question. Um, oh, I see he's providing more information. Uh, I'll tell you what, James, I'll, I'll send this over to, uh, that's interesting, 19.6 safety code. I'll include this information. I'll share it with Tom and uh, afterwards. Um, yeah, that's good points that you bring up. He, he can't see it right now, but I'll show it to him and uh, he can comment back uh, on that. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, the safety codes, perfect. Okay, so one final question before we wrap up. Is the BGV C1 standard only specific to the entertainment industry? I have no idea. Yeah, Tom's not, not focused on that. That would be our other team. Um, but we can get that question addressed for you, Shad, okay? Well, um, again, Tom is, is strictly focused on the industrial side, but we have a whole entertainment team that focuses on that. And speaking of which, for those of you that are active on Twitter, tomorrow is Rig Safe Day. It matches with Arbor Day, and there's going to be a lot of conversations about safe rigging. So if you can join in that conversation, uh, it'll be good. But, Chad, we'll get back to you with an answer. Okay, final question. How often do you recommend attending CM Manual hoist training at our facility? Once every 10 years or five years? Are you asking me that? Uh, yeah. What, how does it work with uh, training? Isn't there like a recertification for certain training that we have? There is. There's an online recertification. Uh, Every five years, correct? Or does it depend? Our on certification. Training? Yeah, our certification for on the the hoists is uh, five years. Okay. Perfect. All right, well, why don't you just go ahead and proceed to the end. I just want to share some training that we have coming up for those that are still on the call. Like I said, we used to we used to save these questions and email everybody afterwards, but we felt this is just a better way to keep everybody on. Okay, um, really quick, upcoming classes. We have a few coming up. Uh, um, rigging and crane operator train the trainer in Niagara in August. And as Tom said, we have some new online recertification. So it saves your companies a lot of money and you a lot of time to do the online recertification after your um, certification has expired. We also have uh, overhead crane and hoist inspection classes in June in Charlotte, as well as a chain hoist technician certification in June in Charlotte. We can find everything on our CMCO Depot website if you're interested in any other training programs that come up. And then last but not least, if you can flip to the last slide, Tom. I just want to let you know how you can find us on social media. We are all over social media. Um, I'm the person that kind of manages that. We have our YouTube channel where all of our videos are posted, including this webinar. If you want to look, we've got about three years worth of safety webinars you can latch on to. We are very active on Twitter. We have a channel for our industrial side as well as our entertainment side. We're active on Facebook, posting all kinds of information there. LinkedIn, Google+, even Instagram with application shots uh, from all over the world. And we also have a blog. I'll send a link to the blog in our follow-up email where you can read about all different types of things that we, we share on industry, products, 
um, regulations, safety, application stories, all that kind of stuff. So um, feel free to su subscribe there or connect to us in any way on social media. Thank you all for coming. We're so glad that you uh, were here to participate. We hope that you got your questions answered. If not, you always free and welcome to shoot a question to us after the fact and we will get it addressed. So we wish you all, I know it's Thursday, but a great weekend. And again, if you're on Twitter tomorrow, join the RigSafe conversation under the hashtag RigSafe. Thank you. Bye-bye.